Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us as we kick off Health One's Spine Solutions virtual event. My name is Angie Ananaya, and I will be your host for the next hour. This evening, we'll be discussing back pain and spine discomfort with our panel of experts. We're so happy to have you join Health One for this virtual event. Health One, as part of HCA Healthcare Continental Division, has recently been named the number one large healthcare system in the US. We're proud to be the best healthcare system in the nation. Let's get right to our discussion. This evening, our panel of experts include Dr. Shay Bess with Denver International Spine Center, Dr. Wusik Chung with Colorado Spine Specialist, and Dr. Michael Galizzi with Ortho One. We begin tonight with Dr. Michael Galizzi at Sky Ridge Medical Center. Dr. Galizzi will be speaking tonight about the minimally invasive approach to spine surgery. Dr. Galizzi. Hi, thank you everybody so much for uh, attending tonight. We really appreciate you um, coming in and uh, having a listen to what we have to say. So one of the things that um, I do uh, significantly different uh, than most people in the state of Colorado is I do a lot of robotic and endoscopic minimally invasive spine surgery. And one of the things that's really important um, in spine surgery, especially fusion surgery, is making sure all the hardware is placed correctly. And what I like to do is do it through the smallest uh, incision possible. And the reason why I do that is because I'm trying to really save all the ligaments and muscles that really make your back function to make sure that the other levels that we aren't um, uh, doing surgery on are still held intact and able to uh, perform their normal function as they would um, if there wasn't uh, spine surgery being performed. So on the right here, you can see uh, this is one of the surgical planning softwares that I use. Um, this is the uh, system that allows me to actually take a CT scan of your body, upload that to a computer program, and then you can see those um, magenta and blue lines with the little yellow screws. That's me actually planning exactly the length, the size, customizing a surgery exactly to your anatomy to make sure that uh, we get the best purchase, the best fixation, and make sure that the hardware is placed um, basically as accurate as uh, possible. And one of the major advantages that I see is significantly less blood loss. There's, uh, t compared to a typical open procedure, um, my blood loss is typically between 50 and 100 mLs, which is like half a can of Coke, um, compared to some of the larger open procedures. You have shorter hospital stays, decreased uh, use of narcotics, and doing a minimally invasive approach um, in this uh, fashion is sort of the same procedure uh, that Tiger Woods had uh, to be able to do that and get back to playing golf uh, a little bit faster. And so what I was always taught as a resident is sort of um, failure to plan is planning to fail. And this uh, ability to use a robotic assistance and computer guidance is really state of the art. And Sky Ridge was the first hospital uh, in the state of Colorado to adopt this uh, technology. Uh, next slide. And one of the cool things that you can do is you can start uh, adapting this technology to doing what's called single position surgery. And single position surgery allows you to do an entire approach from the anterior side. So going not through the belly, but actually just right next to it. And you're able to put in all the uh, devices that you need to expand the vertebral bodies to restore the height, restore the alignment, help decompress the nerves indirectly. But doing it in a single position, I'm also able to uh, put the hardware in to fixate the spine uh, from the lateral position. So you're actually laying on your side. And what this can do is if you have some sort of scoliosis or deformity, we're actually able to correct that deformity uh, with the cages that we're placing and then hold that deformity exactly where it needs to be corrected and implant the hardware. And this is the same type of procedures that's be, that is uh, being carried out at Johns Hopkins, NYU, Duke, uh, Barrows Neurological Institute. Um, and you're able to get this in your backyard here in Colorado. And the nice thing about this is Sky Ridge uh, as a facility and myself is a national teaching site for this. So essentially we have surgeons uh, flying in from all over the United States to come in and uh, watch us do that. So the very, uh, 
cool thing for Coloradoans is this is right in your backyard. And one of the many benefits of this is you can treat one, two, three level disease all through this approach. It can treat shifting of the spine, the spondylolisthesis. You can treat spondyloarthropathies, um, spinal stenosis. A lot of times we have patients that have had previous fusions and we need to do the next level up. I can also do this in a minimally invasive fashion using these techniques. And uh, being able to come in from the side or from the front actually increases the amount of bone graft you're able to put in the uh, intervertebral space. So when you're gluing those bones together, bones actually heal in compression. And so when you're having the bone graft and the grafts on that compression side of the spine, you actually get a, a better chance of a good union. And uh, these new techniques, as uh, noted kind of in the center of the slide here, um, have been written up uh, from Johns Hopkins uh, multiple times as like cutting edge technology. And this is again, available here in Colorado. Uh, next slide, please. So one thing that a lot of patients have issues with is back pain. And that's uh, typically a issue um, that we don't have a good solution for until now. And typically they would do some injections or the pain doctors would come through and do what's called radio frequency ablation and things of that nature. What we can do now is ultra minimally invasive spine surgery, actually using an endoscope or the same type of equipment that a knee or hip surgeon would use uh, to be able to take a meniscus out if you had a torn meniscus or if you had a rotator cuff tear. They would use scopes now to be able to fix that. And now we can do disc herniations reliably um, with the scope. We can also do uh, back pain surgery where we're actually able to transect what's called the medial branch, which is a, a specific nerve that comes out of your spine that talks to that facet joint. And we all know we've had facet pain or pain in the bones of the back of the spine, especially with extension or twisting or rotation. And instead of going to a pain doctor and having them sort of burn the nerve with a needle, what we can do is use basically an incision about as big as a pen or a pencil, and you're actually able to go down to the spine. I'm able to visualize the nerve and anatomy, and I'm actually able to ablate that nerve and uh, get patients back to their activities faster. A couple of examples of this is we had some golfers that actually had multiple previous uh, end, uh, rhizotomies or RFAs as they're called by their pain physician. And they just lasted three months, six months, and then they'd come back. And so if they have um, the ability to still have those pain receptors blocked, we do two sets of injections. If you get greater than 50% of pain relief on those two sets of injections, then I'm actually able to go in and permanently uh, remove that nerve that is facilitating that um, pain in the back We've had multiple people who have had failed RFAs actually get full back pain relief afterwards and be golfing the next week. And one of the advantages of this is it's a very ultra minimally invasive approach. It does not disrupt the uh, muscle tissue. It doesn't uh, burn any bridges to be able to do surgery down the road. And it really ends up being a, a much slicker and smoother outcome for the patient. Another thing we can do is disc herniations. We can actually come into the spine uh, with the scope. Instead of doing drilling or doing a big open laminectomy, I can actually go into the, uh, where the nerve exits and I can actually drive that scope into the spinal canal and actually debride and take the disc out uh, through a small eight millimeter, eight millimeter incision about that big. And what that does, it just decreases the soft tissue damage it's an outpatient procedure. You're not stuck in the hospital, and it really uh, prevents a lot of the other complications associated with detaching ligaments or drilling or removing bone in the spine. And so just wanted to let you know that all these cutting edge state of the art techniques are available right here at Skyridge Medical Center. Um, they're not being performed anywhere else in the Health One HCA system right now uh, in Colorado, and that. Uh, if you need any help, we're more than happy to help you out. Thank you so much, Dr. Galizzi. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Wu Sik Chun with Colorado Spine Specialist at Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center. Dr. Chung will be speaking tonight on cervical and neck problems. Dr. Chung is an expert in degenerative disc disorders, 
with a special focus on neck disorder disorders and cervical spine. Dr. Chung. Hi, right, thanks for including me in this conference. It's an absolute pleasure to share our thoughts and our current practices uh, in the care of spinal diseases. Um, for tonight, I figured um, I would talk about what a pain in the neck growing old is. And uh, with that being said, a lot of people complain about, hey, my neck has pain. I'm getting stiffness in my pain uh, in my neck. I have radiating symptoms down my arm. Uh, I've got numbness in my arm or weakness of the hand or arm function. And maybe we start to have changes in our functional dexterity of our hands. And even sometimes people get balance issues as they're trying to walk. Next slide, please. And so I'll focus in on that what a pain in the neck it is uh, with the upper part of the spine. And next slide. And this includes the bony structure of seven of the top vertebrae or bone segments in our uh, spine. And uh, overall, we have a gentle bow-shaped curvature of the neck to hold our head up and our big brain up there. Um, and uh, it includes uh, some of the vertebrae that allow us to rotate our neck left to right, and some of the lower vertebrae that allows us to flex our necks forward and backwards, and also to the side left and right. Next paragraph. And within the bony structure includes the special neurologic structures, including the spinal cord and our nerve roots that come off of the spinal cord at specific levels in the cervical spine that help control and also innervate different parts of our arm. Typically, uh, as you can see in that picture, uh, the different uh, sensory distributions are attached to different nerves coming off of the spinal cord. Also, we have the motor control. For example, the upper cervical uh, nerve root of C3 can primarily help with lung diaphragm control, so our breathing control. Uh, the C4 nerve roots can help us with our paraspinal muscles, such as shrugging our shoulders. The C5 nerve root helps control that shoulder control, the deltoid muscle, whereas the C6 helps us with our biceps our, uh, and our wrist extension. C7 helps with the triceps and the wrist flex, flexing down. Uh, the C8 and T1 typically help our hand control, like our grip strength and spreading our fingers. Next part, uh, next slide. <laughs> and the neck moves uh, the motion anatomy by the use of the disc and facet joints controlled by our muscles around us. So. Every level has a disc and it acts as a typical shock absorber and a motion segment. And the disc is comprised of the outer ring or the thick annulus fibrosis. And inside is contained this thing called the nucleus pulposus, which is typically full of uh, fluid. Um, but unfortunately that fluid can be what they call chemotaxic or very inflammatory. So we try to keep that nucleus pulposus inside the annulus of the disc so it doesn't leak out and create inflammation. Also, on the back side of uh, the, the vertebrae, we have a pair of facet joints. And these are sliding joints that act in conjunction with the disc to control the motion and also help stabilize each of the segments. Next part, uh, next slide. Oh, we can move on to the next and one more. And so with that being said, oh, can we go back a slide? Um, we wanted to talk about what happens as all of us start to age. And unfortunately, we haven't found the fountain of youth yet. So we've got to figure out how to manage these degenerative conditions of our cervical spine and what they encompass. Next slide. 
And what we understand about disc is that over time, it does wear out and it can create problems. And I think many of us have heard the dis, uh, di, uh, description disc degenerative disease. And what is that? Well, we thought that as we get really old, you know, kind of like my age, um, our discs start to degenerate and wear out and create problems. But actually, research has shown that the degenerative process starts really early, as early as our late teenage years, as you can see in these pictures. What happens is the hydration of the disc starts to go down and the gene expression goes down and the number of viable living cells that make up the disc start to go down. And by 17 years old, you can see that picture where it looks rather different from when you were only seven years old and imagine when you're about 55 years old, what happens and dries up with the discs. So what ends up happening are mechanical effects where the outer border or that annulus fibrosis starts to dry out and they start to get fissures and little tears, almost like car tire rubber that has been sitting out in the sun for too long. And then what can happen is that nucleus can start to leak out or herniate and what happens is because these are inflammatory situations, it can create a lot of pain in that area. What happens mechanically is that the disc space starts to decrease in height and collapse. And this can then secondarily lead to a tra entrapment or compression of the nerves in that area. I think we've heard of different terms of disc protrusion, disc herniation, disc extrusion. All of those are just cascades of worsening leakage, if you will, of the nucleus pulposus out of the disc and starts to affect the neural elements, uh, whether in the spinal canal against the spinal cord or the nerve roots coming out of the spinal cord to the different arm functions. And what we experience are mechanical neck pain, radiating arm symptoms, and even spinal cord symptoms. Next slide. So overall, this aging process is a cascade. It's a combination of disc degeneration and collapse. The facet joints in the back becoming overwhelmed and becoming arthritic. And then what happens is the space for the nerve roots to come out of the foramen starts to get narrower and narrower and ultimately ends up pinching the nerves. And this can also lead to spinal canal narrowing, which is the more, more concerning of the situation as this can start to potentially affect the spinal cord itself. So when we talk about foraminal narrowing and pinching of the nerve roots, we describe that as a neurologic pathology of radiculopathy. And that radiculopathy is ridiculous pain down the arm typically. Whereas when we have canal narrowing, we talk about what can be termed as myelopathy or damage to the spinal cord itself. And this is a little more grave as it can lead to functional deterioration of our hand function, arm function, and even walking balance. And if this starts to perseverate, it's something that we need to be well aware of and keep a close eye on. Next slide. So the most, most important part of diagnosing and analyzing this is really the history and examination of that patient. We want to get to know the patient very well and understand the history of their situation with their pain in the neck, if you will. And once we understand that, we also go through a full examination process where we can look at the neck range of motion and then the upper extremity exams, uh, with what I call the Macarena, um, uh, to do the sensory, motor, reflex, and dexterity exams. Um, there should be a video right now going, but I guess not. That's okay. 
Um, and then also things like the balance where uh, we analyze the gate to see if there is imbalance, almost like as if, unfortunately, you got pulled over for potential drunk driving and they try to test you for, you know, your tandem gate. Next slide, please. Once we have um, the history and the physical exam, sometimes we'll ask people to get further tests so that we can analyze a pathology a little more carefully and uh, in more detail. And these include things like the x-ray, which allows us to visualize the bone structure and also the overall alignment, especially with gravity when somebody's standing up or leaning forward or leaning backwards to assess for instability. Um, we also get things like the MRI scans, which help us visualize the soft tissues in three dimensions and allows us to see things like a herniated disc that may be compressing the spinal cord or the nerve roots. CT scans can also help us analyze for joint arthritis and potentially even fractures or even um, compression fractures uh, for people who might be osteoporotic. Further tests to really pinpoint down to the nerve fibers and also to rule out other things like carpal tunnel syndrome, we can use tests like nerve conduction studies. Next slide. And then how do we treat this? Well, typically our bodies are pretty darn amazing. And we say the rule of thumb is that 90% get better by 90 days. It's our own bodies doing their own healing process to try and treat the problem. However, if that's not happening and our symptoms continue to worsen or perseverate, the mainstay of treatment is typically non-surgical modalities. They include physical therapy, medications, and injections. The thought process behind physical therapy is that, well, we want to strengthen the muscles around the spinal column structure. From our biomechanical studies, we understand about 70% of the biomechanical burden goes through the actual spinal column with the bone, the discs, the facet joints, and 30% go to the muscle structure. So if we can strengthen the muscles to take on 40%, of the biomechanical stress, then we've got less biomechanical strain going through the spinal column. So it eases the disc and the facet joints, and this can help with the pain and some of the symptoms. Medications typically are used for an anti-inflammatory effect as the degenerative process can elicit that and uh, the inf inflammatory cascade against the joints and the nerves. And so uh, things like um, even Advil to all the way to steroids can sometimes help with this situation. In terms of more severe nerve pain, we can use some neuroleptic type medications and also for muscle pain because it's overstraining to try and take care of the spinal column, we can use some muscle relaxants. In cases where the symptoms are so severe that these uh, modalities don't help, a lot of times our physiatry specialists can use their special techniques to do injections, uh, epidural injections or facet injections to really help some of the pain. And many times, in most cases, they do amazingly well. And we hear patients say, oh my goodness, it was a miracle when I got my injection. So that's really the mainstay of treatment. Next slide. So how about surgery? Where does that come into play? Well, we typically say surgery is really reserved as the last line of defense, you know, and it's really used for what we call red flag neurologic symptoms. Surgical indications include progressive neurologic deficits, whereas such as the radicular pain down the arm is getting worse and it's starting to create weakness in that nerve distribution, um, which injections or therapy are not helping. And then um, also the more concerning myelopathic symptoms where the spinal cord is being affected, that's a little more concerning. 
Um, also, sometimes the structure is so worn down that we have instability of the vertebrae and the segments, and that can in, in turn lead to damage to the neurologics, and that may be a, po a possible surgical indication. Also, if somebody's gone through all the non-surgical modalities and their symptoms continue to perseverate with specific pathology, that may be something we consider surgery for. When I do discuss surgery with patients, we kind of look at first the, the overall theory behind and the goals behind surgery rather than specific techniques per se. And overall, we talk about surgical goals. And these surgical goals typically will include neural decompression, structural stabilization, possible motion restoration, and overall restoration of the architecture or the alignment of the spine. And these can be achieved in many different ways, um, but overall, uh, next slide please. Some of the uh, basic techniques um, it really depends on the pathology, the patient and their own expectations. And these could include things like an anterior from the front cervical discectomy, taking out the herniated disc or damaged disc, and then fusing that level. Or things like cervical disc replacement, which also takes out a degenerated or herniated disc but tries to maintain motion with these devices at that segment. Sometimes when there's multiple levels that are in question with patho pathology, um, we may consider a posterior fusion, especially with overgrown arthritis of the facet joints impinging the spinal cord. And this may include instrumentation like those little screws and rods and opening up the space for the spinal cord. And then other techniques, more minimally invasive techniques can include foraminotomy. Um, and this may use techniques uh, like Dr. Galizi just talked about, um, using very microscopic techniques to open up spaces where the nerve may be compressed. Other techniques include uh, laminoplasty, which is a technique of trying to open up a little more room in the spinal canal by cutting one side of the back roof of the spinal canal and pushing it open so that the overall space for the spinal canal is slightly improved. Overall, we want to always achieve that opening for the spinal canal and the foramen and still maintain the architecture. So here's my take home message, if you will. Know the anatomy, know that we have seven vertebrae with discs and a pair of facet joints that make up the structural part of the cervical spine. And this then encompasses the spinal cord and the nerve roots that come out at each level to give specific sensory and motor functions. The degeneration of this area is, unfortunately, we all get older, is a cascade of events that include the disc and facet joints as they wear out, and then ultimately can result in the tightness or stenosis of the spinal canal and the foramen. And this can result in actual neck pain, but also neurologic symptoms such as radiculopathy and myelopathy. We have to always make sure that we diagnose these conditions accurately and as appropriately as possible and follow up with the patients with appropriate exams uh, uh, to make sure that we're not missing anything and that the pathology isn't getting worse. And the mainstay of treatment is non-surgical modalities. But unfortunately, sometimes we have to consider surgery uh, in certain conditions such as unremitting pain despite formal non-surgical modalities or progressive neurologic deficits. Thank you, and I hope that helps a little bit in better understanding, oh, what a pain it is in the neck. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Thanks so much for that. So next up, we welcome Dr. Shay Bess with Denver International Spine Center, or DISC, at Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center. Dr. Bess will be speaking tonight on scoliosis. 
Dr. Bess has devoted a large portion of his professional career to research to improve the treatment for patients with scoliosis. Dr. Bess. Thanks, Angie. Nice talks, Mike and Lusik. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, next slide, please. Talk about scoliosis. This is primarily going to be geared toward adults. Scoliosis. It's it's a curvature of the spine in the frontal phase uh, that we view the patient uh, from skull down plane and then on the side plane. But as you as on the X-ray, and go to the next slide, please. That scoliosis is curvature in the frontal plane. We can act of the scoliosis of the curves, and there's typically in the spine. Uh, the reason why that is is because we walk upright, and so we want to keep our head over our pelvis. There are two large, major deforming curves. And then there's going to be probably a longer curve than in the upper part of the spine. And so these are six spine, uh, which is the, where the rib cage is, a curve up by the neck, and then a curve then the lower part of the rib cage, and then down the lumbar spine, as you can see on the left as well as on the right. Next slide, please. And if you look at the most common causes for scoliosis, this is in the adult. It's either going to be adult or adult degenerative. And what does that mean? Adult idiopathic scoliosis means it's residual from childhood or adult degenerative scoliosis, which is caused by arthritis. Some causes, uh, these are also going to be residual from childhood. It's which is a malformed vertebrae at birth, neuromuscular, have or born with a neuromuscular problem such as cerebral and or syndromic scoliosis, again, which is gonna be uh, much less common into adulthood. Next slide. The adult idiopathic versus the adult degenerative, you can see the idiopathic, like we said, from childhood, so they're going to usually have a history of childhood scoliosis, usually diagnosed in school. And then key to this, though, is going to be a thoracic curve, so a curve that's up the area where the rib cage is. Next slide. The film here on the right, degenerative scoliosis. This is all that no history of child scoliosis. This is caused by our doctor's office uh, patients typically to have back pain, lumbar scoliosis, and either a very, very small or no thoracic scoliosis. And again, much smaller, as you can see here on the right, compared to the scoliosis on the left. So then what are the symptoms of scoliosis? Uh, we know from our research on the present International Spine Study Group. There are 25 sites across the country, and we uh, with scoliosis and are evaluating their symptoms as for the treatment. And we know that scoliosis can have on physical function. This is a graph from the paper that we wrote now about six years ago, looking at comparison of scoliosis to other chronic diseases, and we found from an overall function standpoint, similar impact is cancer and diabetes from a physical function standpoint. There's going to be impact, and there's some going to, that are going to have even larger impact. The, pain. the most common symptom, which we're going to see on the next slide, actually is difficulty with scoliosis, and then also difficulty with activities, including work as well as social function. Next slide, please. So this is a patient that uh, then I treated for scoliosis. Scoliosis in, in the thoracic spine, so clearly this is going to be in a large idiopathic scoliosis. Pictures uh, clinically down below, you see a, a rib hump, and this most commonly are back pain uh, caused by arthritis at the spine joints, as well as muscle fatigue from trying to stand upright. 
leg pain either caused by pinched nerves, secondary to the scoliosis or the arthritis. And if we see here on the right, this study that we did just published three months ago through our spine study group, we found that self-image is actually the most impacted um, domain within patients that have scoliosis. Sounds like my audio is cutting in and out, is that right? Right yeah. side, about 90, you know, 93% of patients. Yeah, so Sorry, I, we, you're just a little bit spotty, but so I'm just going to ask you to speak up and try not to move too much because it seems like when you move, it gets a little bit audio. So, so sorry to interrupt, but we. Yeah, that's okay, that's fine. That's so, been about 93% of have um, self image that's going to be impacted by the scoliosis. And they're also going to report difficulty with. So again, the most common symptoms, back and leg pain, self-image, as well as difficulty with. Next. If we look at un get questions from patients, is my scoliosis going to cause paralysis or am I going to lose bowel or bladder function? Essentially, scoliosis does not cause these symptoms. So this should not be one of the concerns thousand patients that we've enrolled in our studies, none of these patients had on. There's also some concern patients have that's going to, the scoliosis is going to compromise the heart and the lungs. This is very common. The curve has to be over 110 degrees. And again, most, most scoliosis that, that doctors and patients see is not going to be that large. And the other concern that patients often have is rapid curve progression. This is also very common. Scoliosis progresses about one degree per year if the scoliosis is over 50 degrees. But five years to diagnose that, even one degree change, because for scoliosis is about five degrees. So it takes several years to so again, rapid curve progression, very, very uncommon. So well, then what are the treatment goals for adult school? Not to treat for prevent things that don't happen. Paralysis, law. A lot of questions about that from patients. This essentially does not happen. So do not loss of bile or bladder function because it's not going to happen. If we look at the pain, function, and self-image, treatment for scoliosis can improve these. And this is a third paper that we have from the ISSG. And we found that there's about a 50% improved treatment for scoliosis in pain, function, image. But again, if you don't have these symptoms, namely if you're good function and you're not concerned about self-image, then for sure don't have surgery, don't have any treatment. If you have mild symptoms, physical therapy and injections they do not help this condition, but physical therapy and injections can. If you're in severe and nothing's working, then surgery can help. But again, that's usually saved to the very end. Next slide. The patient that we saw at the very beginning, she's a 59 year old patient that has a large thoracic lumbar, uh, large thoracic and lumbar scoliosis residual from childhood. She was braced in adolescence. She has very mild pain with standing. She's very well balanced able to do the activities that she wants to do and not concerned with it. For her physical therapy to assist with her standing endurance. Next slide. Whereas this is another patient who is a paralegal that we treated uh, large residual scoliosis from childhood. And again, had severe pain with standing, unable to do the activity with her appearance. So then we wound up doing corrective surgery uh, to pull the scoliosis, and we got a nice correction. See that she, her head is now back over her pelvis with a nice reduction of her rib prominence. Next slide. 
So in conclusion, scoliosis is a curvature of the frontal plane. If you look at the symptoms, functional interference as well as self-image, it can absolutely However, paralysis, loss in bowel bladder function, and rapid progression of the curve essentially does not happen in the adult. And dose do have treatment for symptoms that you have, do not have treatment for the symptoms that you don't have, never have. And again, just like all the other doctors on this uh, uh, series have recommended, start with the least aggressive physical therapy, absolutely can help. You have surgery can have about 50% improvement in pain, function, as well as self-image. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bess. And thanks for hanging in there with your audio. I know it's a little bit spotty, but we, we could hear it. So thanks everyone for uh, hanging in with us. So actually, so right now we're, it starts our Q&A session and I really appreciate all the questions that have come in. And actually, Dr. Bess, I'm gonna start with you since we just uh, ended with you. Um, is there a, an age limit to, or uh, any treatment that you're looking at with, with scoliosis? And is there also another question that came in, is there a way to prevent adult scoliosis? Um, someone in their 30s, 40s, if they do start to see a curvature, is there something that they can do to help prevent it as they get older? Start with that, the, the, the last one he says, so prevention for scoliosis. You know, I think that's difficult, especially then uh, you're you're somewhat stuck with it, but it, that doesn't in association with it. Um, I think that that staying active as well as healthy can absolutely prevent the symptoms that you may have from scoliosis, but it may not prevent it. If you uh, psoriatic arthritis or other inflammatory diseases, the medications that your doctor gives or decrease the symptoms of the scoliosis, I'm sorry, of your inflammatory arthritis can absolutely delay the onset of the scoliosis in those conditions. Your second question then, uh, is there an age limit for treatment? Really, it depends on the severity of the symptoms and how healthy the person is. I think physical therapy undeniably and the data supports that physical therapy helps the symptoms in association with scoliosis. And it's uncommon to have or limb threatening symptoms with scoliosis. So that should be the, the hallmark first and first of all, uh, treat scoliosis. Great. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Galizzi, we have a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first one is, how do you know if you are a good candidate for minimally invasive surgery? You know, on, honestly, right now, there's so many things that we can treat in a minimally invasive fashion. Um, really, the, the biggest things that we can't do uh, in a minimally invasive fashion is kind of like stuff that Dr. Bess is doing, those big, big adult reconstruction including thoracic, lumbar, spine, going into the pelvis, doing big deformity corrections. But essentially, any adult uh, degenerative scoliosis can now be treated in a, um, in a minimally invasive fashion. So your typical disc herniations, uh, your decompressions for spinal stenosis or neurogenic claudication, you can't walk very far, you bend over, you use the grocery cart to get around. Um, all those things can really be treated in a minimally invasive fashion. Um, and especially in the neck, like Dr. Chung alluded to, you can do cervical foraminotomies. Um, you can do motion sparing things. Most of the stuff in the neck um, by nature with the anterior cervical discectomy infusion when you're going through the front of the spine here is already a pretty, pretty minimally invasive uh, approach already. Uh, most of the stuff, um, while I do do a fair bit of cervical, most of the stuff that I'm doing is really focused on the degenerative lumbar SI joint um, disc herniation uh, era. So pretty much anyone's a candidate unless you have a big deformity kind of like Dr. Bess's patients. Wonderful. Uh, my second question for you is um, sciatic nerve. There's, yeah. We've had several different questions in uh, talking about sciatic nerve pain. Any, if you could kind of address that, at what point should someone see their physician or surgeon? 
Yeah, so, you know, the sciatic nerve is kind of a confluence of lots of different spinal nerves that come out of the spine and sort of join and that typically people say, oh, I have sciatica. And really what that is referring to is the direct sciatic nerve that runs down the back of your leg, goes down to your foot, usually the small toe, bottom of the foot, and the calf region. And that's the typical sciatic nerve pain that most people have. That's typically from an L5 S1 disc herniation. Sometimes it can be from a L4 5 disc herniation as well, or just degeneration of those levels. And sometimes if it's not diagnosed correctly, you can actually have that nerve be impinged in your hip area as well. That can sometimes be bound up in the preiformis area. That's more rare, uh, but it can happen. And so really the sciatic nerve is a confluence of those nerves and really um, like Dr. Chung alluded to, being able to pinpoint target based on imaging, exam, and then diagnostic studies, including an EMG, which tests the wires in your body, because essentially the nerves in our spine are basically electrical wires, and we just got to test and see where the short circuit is. And in additionally, you can do injections to block certain nerves to really pinpoint and diagnose exactly where the surgery needs to be performed. Great information. Wonderful. Thank you. Dr. Chung, a couple of questions for you as well. If someone has a neck injury or they think that they have a neck injury, what should next steps be? Do they start with their primary care physician? Do they call a surgeon like yourself? Like, what should they do? You know, overall, I always think of the primary care physicians as the general of the whole military field. Um, and so it's always a good idea when we've got concerns about our health, including our neck, whether it was an injury or we're getting older and having issues, you know, um, to, to first um, discuss it with your primary care physician. Um, and what they can do is look at the overall picture also knowing that the history with that patient for a lot longer than uh, coming straight to a spine surgeon for the first time. And like we said, um, a lot of these uh, cervical issues or spinal issues, we are able to manage by our own biology or a lot of non-surgical modalities. So typically those would be the best ways to take care of the problem. And it also allows your primary care physician to kind of tabulate that and say, oh, you know, Mr. Jones, this is your fourth time you're coming in for the same neck issue. I think at this point, it's time for you to see a specialist. Um, so that allows them a better idea of your overall health and the progression. And then if needs be, involve somebody like us. Great. And I, I see you answered this in the chat, but I'd love for you to answer for the whole audience. You we're one of the questions came out about the life expectancy of a disc replacement. Can you talk about that? That's a really good question. And um, so currently the uh, longest term studies that we have uh, for cervical disc replacements is approximately 15 years. And so they're looking at not only the, the outcomes for the neurologics and outcomes for the biomechanics, um, but also the wear pattern of these disc replacements. And there are several out currently uh, that are approved by the FDA. And so typically right now, these disc replacements have been around for about 15 years. Um, and so we're seeing that they continue to work well uh, in, in that time frame. However, what is the wear of these mechanical devices as we go on longer? We don't quite know yet. So that's data still to come. Um, so we hear about things like knee replacements, hip replacements lasting about 15 to 20 years now. Is it similar with the cervical spine? Well, the thought process is that in the cervical spine, there is less motion and less biomechanical forces. So could the disc replacements last longer? Maybe, but we also have to realize 
these disc replacements are a lot smaller in the neck, so could they wear out faster? So these are questions that we still have yet to answer and find out about. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Dr. Galizzi, I'm gonna go back to you. Uh, there's been several questions about um, arthritis in the spine. Yep. Can you address that in some potential uh, some treatments or options? Or again, I'm as Dr. Chung said, we should always start with our primary care physician. But if someone does come to you with with severe arthritis, what are some options? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we we take all comers, so you know, we we definitely appreciate all our uh, great uh, primary care physicians uh, directing some patients to us. But sometimes we get uh, the direct referral, and we actually have to do uh, the workup start to finish. So, in general, what we do um, if they don't have any ulcers or GI issues or anticoagulation issues, we generally like starting with anti-inflammatory treatment in combination with some low dose muscle relaxers. And then we get you into therapy right away. And as Dr. Chung alluded to, a lot of times therapy can help uh, build strength along the muscles, the bones, the ligaments, make sure we're as strong as we can be. Having a tight core or tight uh, abdominal cavity, that's really helpful in uh, that back arthritis. Um, and when those uh, issues uh, are not shooting down your legs or you're having a neurologic symptom in combination with it, and it's just pure back pain or neck pain, uh, what we can do is we do selective blocks, and that's um, what I use. Uh, they're called medial branch blocks, and those actually block the nerve that innervates those facet joints. You can't really fix the arthritis um, because that's a continually degenerative process. And even with stem cell treatments and all the new modalities, stem cell treatment isn't quite there to be able to reverse that aging process. So what we can do, uh, instead of just gluing those bones together, because we know that definitely stops the arthritis, right? Because the, the joint no longer moves. What I do is I block those nerves. Uh, I usually send uh, to my pain colleagues or the interventional guys at uh, RIA, Envision Sally Joe. What I do with, uh, we block those nerves, and if you get greater than 50% of pain reduction from that axial back pain, two sets of those injections would then qualify you to be a good successful candidate for me to actually use a scope and just burn that nerve in an outpatient procedure. Wonderful, great. Um, and let's see, Dr. Chung, I'm gonna go back to you. Is there, we've had, the, the age question kind of keeps coming up uh, in the chat room as well. So if, if someone is in their 80s or late 70s and they've got either some stenosis or degenerative discs, is there an age range where you would probably say, let's look at other options as opposed to surgery? Or does it really just depend on the patient's health? That's a very good question. I think number one, you know, as surgeons or physicians, we want to make sure we're taking care of the whole patient, you know, and not just the spine or that pathology. And so whatever their age is, um, we want to make sure that we're looking at the whole picture um, of the patient, uh, their overall health, and putting that into the equation. I think always we want to try and use the minimally invasive or you know non-surgical modalities to help try and take care of that pathology or that patient. Um, but if we were ultimately, unfortunately, looking at a situation where we had to consider surgery, the actual what we call chronologic age, whether they're 81 or 82. Um, that isn't the be all end all. Um, as we know, there are people who are much younger who could be in much poorer health than somebody older who's been active and has no uh, uh, significant medical history. So if it actually came to a potential discussion with an individual that's failed all non-surgical modalities, and let's say they're getting progressive neurologic symptoms that's inhibiting their life, um, then one of the important things is going back to that statement about primary care physicians, liaising with their primary care doctors, maybe their cardiologist or other uh, medical specialist to do a full evaluation of the actual 
medical health, medical age of the patient to see if they are somebody that could potentially undergo surgery or it may be too difficult in terms of their health to undergo surgery and the recovery process. So it's not as simple a question as 80 years old. It's also have we A, truly identified the pathology, B, try to maximize non-surgical modalities, and then C, if we're kind of looking at that dire situation, then make sure we communicate and pair up, team up with the medical physicians to do the best for the health care of that patient. Uh, unfortunately, we have to wrap things up. I really want to say thank you for all the questions, and I apologize that we didn't get to all the questions. You all had some wonderful uh, inquiries in the chat room. Uh, we'd really like to thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you to Drs. Bess, Chung, and Galizzi for sharing your expertise with us. In closing, I just want to say we've seen people delay care due to COVID concerns. We ask all of you to visit the doctor and stay on top of your regular screenings. Please do not put off routine care. Finally, wear a mask in public, wash your hands, and please practice social distancing. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have a great evening.